All right, good day, everybody. This is Matt Webb with UT Extension Marshall County. I came to you once again doing the lunch series. Um, appreciate everyone that's on with us today. We got a very distinguished and personally, I think one of the better specialists that we have at UT. We have a Dr. David Lockwood with us. Uh, he is our fruit tree, fruit, small fruit specialist. Does an incredible job for not only us, but also just across the nation when it comes to managing uh, fruit. So appreciate you being on with us, Dr. Lockwood, and we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matt. You're, you're very kind. Uh, today, I thought we'd talk a little bit about topics that are going on right now out in the orchards and the vineyards and, and cover some things that hopefully will be of benefit or at least of interest to you. And I guess the first thing we need to do is start off a little bit on COVID-19. Uh, it's had a, a fairly significant impact and will continue to do so on our uh, operations. Uh, many of our growers were pick your own operations. Fruit crops are fairly uh, well adapted to that. But because of COVID-19 and the concerns that we're seeing, a uh, number of them have decided that Pick Your Own is not going to be offered at their place this year. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But for the growers that are still doing Pick Your Own, uh, there are some things we suggest. Uh, first off, all employees that have any visibility with their customers should be encouraged to use face masks and gloves. Uh, should wash their hands frequently, basically saying that if they don't do it, the customers are going to be not as receptive to doing it themselves. Customers should be encouraged to wear face masks and gloves, and it might be that if you, uh, in your advertisements, you, you might put a statement to that effect in there, but uh, it's for their benefit as well as yours. In some areas where you've got fairly high traffic flow, uh, it's been suggested that growers might want to make appointments with people to come out and pick. It's kind of hard to do because I know a lot of people come by the farm kind of on impulse, but uh, if they have appointments, it makes it a little bit better about scheduling the crowd and spreading out the, the, the bunch of people that might tell. Uh, whatever the case, in the field, uh, up by the checkout and so on. And you should have uh, numerous stations for hand washing and sanitizing hands. It's been suggested if possible to use separate entrances and exits to the field or by the checkout station so that people are not going to be uh, in as close a contact. You should use only the containers that the grower provides People should not be allowed to bring their own containers, or they should not be allowed to bring back your container to refill uh, during the period of this uh, pandemic. And then, uh, in some cases, if possible, have set patterns of travel in the field to help maintain social distancing. So, if you were, say, picking strawberries, you could have uh, every other row down one row, back up the next, sort of like they're doing in some of the grocery stores. Uh, it's not going to be a perfect answer, but at least it's going to be something. If you're uh, not doing pick your own, but are doing on farm marketing, uh, many of the same points. Everybody should wear masks and gloves and wash hands. Uh, try to do whatever you can to uh, encourage social distancing in the market. Uh, some cases, that means limiting the number of customers that can come in at one time. Uh, and, and that's that's also not an easy thing to do, but hopefully people will understand. If possible, separate entrances and exits to discourage people say, getting in close contact. It's better, it's easier uh, to maintain sanitary conditions for people to pay with a, a card as opposed to cash. And, and there's been a lot of different uh, thoughts on how you could handle cash. One being put it in a separate box, and leave it there for three days before you try to use it to make change and so on to allow any potential contamination to be great. But uh, so, you know, 
cash is going to be the way some people want to do business. I know it's the way I prefer because I don't like surprises in the credit card statement at the end of the month, but uh, it is easier if they do use cards. In some cases, we've actually seen growers uh, do a drive through market and they actually tell the customers, we'll come to your car, you don't need to, and are discouraged from getting out of the car. And uh, again, don't bring their containers. Uh, you do not want any children or pets in the market. Uh, again, it's trying to control the people so that uh, everything stays as clean as possible. If you were given out free samples of, of produce, that should dis be discontinued through the duration of the pandemic. And again, have plenty of hand washing and sanitizing stations. And then there are more things that come along, but those kind of cover the waterfront. Some of them are easier to do than others, uh, but any attempt to, to try to make things safer for yourself, your family, your employees, and your customers should be appreciated. Moving on, we're picking up new kinds of issues all the time. And, and this actually occurred last year in one of our blueberry growers in Loudoun County. Uh, I, I write the wildlife control recommendations for the southeast and foot south. And now uh, we're having to control our foot control to bears in because they're showing up more and more. Uh, just blueberry planting. We had bears at the apple barn earlier this year. Uh, they're something that we're going to have to take into account. So it makes life interesting uh, and also uh, perhaps a little bit uh, more exciting when you go to the field. Um, this spring has been very unusual. 2020 is going to go down the books as a weird year. And uh, we had numerous frost freeze events late in the season. The last one, depending on where you were in Tennessee, occurred in mid-May, like the 13th of May. Uh, and as a result, many of our crops were well advanced past the time that we normally see cold damage. And so uh, this slide shows some blueberries at the Middle Tennessee Station. Uh, these are our uh, legacy, our, high, our southern hardwoods. But uh, as we looked at the blooms and asked to develop some berries, um, on the right hand side, you can see a close up of several berries. Uh, and the ones that were kind of water soaked in color when I cross section them or black or were dead or damaged to the point that they never will mature. But yet there were several berries that were still uh, in good shape on the plant. So we had some uh, crop thinning as a result in blueberries. And we also saw a good bit in other crops. Um, Matt, this came out of, uh, well, the slide on my right came out of Forge's Orchard, and the other one came out of Williamson County. But these peaches suffered what we call cat scratching, which is cold damage. And, and it occurred after the peach was developed. The cold was not severe enough or long enough to kill the fruit. But the scarring you see is cold injured. Uh, those peaches are going to be very misshapen. They're, uh, for the most part, they're not going to drop off the tree. Some of the uh, fruit with the lesser damage will go ahead and mature, and part of the peach will be usable. Others will never get to the point where you can use them. And with uh, Forge's Orchard, uh, they had one variety, Red Haven, that was down next to the road, which is the lowest part of the orchard. They saw this damage in Red Haven, but as you started to climb the slope, just a little bit of increase in elevation uh, was enough to protect the fruit, and they no longer saw any damage. So this is typical in some of our orchards. You may see it. You may get some questions, um, and that's what it is. Uh, this is the same thing on apples. It's called frost grade, where the frost occurred after the fruit had set and started to grow. And depending on, again, the conditions of the frost, you'll get this rough callus ring around the fruit. And that will restrict the growth of the fruit, in, especially when it's severe, like the apple on the right. And it'll carry through the harvest. So it looks weird. Uh, and it's not as nice a fruit as it was. But in some of the cases, like the apple on the left, it'll be fine. It'll be a usable apple. Um, 
is quite an advantage. Perhaps the biggest problems I encountered with cold injury was in the beans this year. And, and uh, this slide shows uh, some uh, vineyards in uh, Wheaton County and also in uh, Gibson County where the shoots had actually grown out six, seven inches or longer when we had the cold event. And of course, it, it fried them and, and killed them back. Uh, at the time it happened, uh, there were a lot of concerned people about what to expect in the vineyard. And, and uh, this is kind of a, a difficult situation to address. So we tell people, not to get too excited. This is a close-up of, of uh, HRH vineyards in Gibson County. Again, you can see the dieback that they encountered. Uh, but I tell people not to be too excited too quickly and don't assess the crop until you actually have good uh, reasons to go ahead and, and figure out what you've got left. And this slide shows the compound bud of the grape. The primary bud is what gave us the shoots that we saw damaged by the frost. They, uh, that's the first bud to emerge. It'll give you the best uh, fruit, the biggest clusters, the most clusters, uh, but because it's early, it's the most apt to be damaged. In the cases that we saw this year, uh, the primaries were killed for the most part in many vineyards. And after uh, 10 days, two weeks, the secondary bud would break and start to grow and in some cases, the secondary bud can also fruit. And that's one of the things we want to see to, uh, before we actually assess our potential for a grape crop. Uh, with the secondary bud, uh, depending on the type of grape, you may get a crop or part of the crop, or you may get essentially a, a less than 25% of a crop, which we consider to be non-fruitful. And for the most part, the American varieties of grapes like Concord, Niagara, Catawba, Sudan are considered to be non fruitful and secondary. Muscadines are non fruitful, as are vinifers. But the French American hybrids, and a lot of what we plant to make wines out of in Tennessee are French American hybrids. And as a group, they tend to be more fruitful on secondary buds to the point that. Some varieties, like Save All, will give you almost a regular crop off the secondary bud. But it's important to be able to know what the variety is and how the secondary buds are developing before we make a decision on future care in the vineyard. Uh, one of the things we're seeing, if you've got both uh, some surviving primary uh, shoots and a secondary crop coming on, now you're going to have two crops of grapes on the vine at the same time, but they tend to uh, close up the gap in ripening as you get towards the end of the season. And, but it still may be necessary to do a second harvest. That is, go through and pick the primary, which would be the first clusters of ripening, and then come back later on and pick the secondary crop if possible. If, however, you get a lot of damage, uh, it's important still to not turn your back on the vineyard and walk away because the fruit buds for next year are initiating this summer. And so you need to keep the vines healthy enough to get good bud initiation and also to get good healthy cane growth that we're going to use when we prune next winter uh, to select our canes and spurs for the 2021 crop. So again, uh, I, I Try to encourage growers to wait and see. Uh, and the reports I'm getting now, some vineyards I was in one in Blunt County uh, a couple weeks ago looked like it had not had any damage at all. But I talked to the grower in Obion County. He's saying overall maybe 30% of the crowd. So it it's hurt us. It's hurt us bad. I put this in just as a, a reminder. Uh, I keep getting. Uh, contacts from people that want to plant blueberries or grapes and you ask them when do you want to plant and this is now I want to plant right now and uh, they haven't necessarily figured out what field they want to plant in they haven't soil tested they haven't done anything to get ready for it and, and uh, I try to discourage them uh, as much as I can to uh, from overreacting and getting too big a rush and one of the ways I do that is to, to use something like this slide. So a year or so, 
in advance of planting should be spent just trying to get the site ready. And then after you plant, be aware that the crop is not going to be on the, the plant for a couple of years or more, depending on the type of fruit, uh, and uh, just to develop the framework of the plant before you actually let it start to grow. Uh, as far as what we're starting to see now, uh, this is iron deficiency in blueberry. Uh, the bottom part of the slide is, is perhaps more typical of a normal situation. Iron deficiency is a pretty good indicator that the soil pH is too high. Uh, normally, once the pH of the soil gets 5.3 uh, to 5.5 or above, you should expect to see iron deficiency coming in. Uh, the shoots will have an inner vein of chlorosis. The veins will be fairly dark green, but the tissue between them will be yellow. Uh, shoot and leaf size will be reduced. And uh, you can do a quick fix by spraying with iron chelate. You probably take uh, three or four sprays, uh, but it's temporary. The only good fix for it is to lower that soil pH. And so when I see this, uh, I ask when was the last soil test taken, and uh, usually when it, it comes back, it'll need to have uh, the soil drop. Elemental sulfur is probably the most common material that we use. Sprinkled on top of the ground, if you uh, normal rainfall, it'll move in the soil fairly quickly and uh, can do the job. One thing about elemental sulfur, though, is uh, it doesn't want to be put out in late fall. Uh, put it out mid summer. Uh, once you get soil temperatures below about 50 degrees, it doesn't do anything. And so, our uh, sulfur is relatively mobile in the soil. If, if it's applied in the fall, by the time spring comes about, it's sort of like nitrogen. It may no longer be where the plant can get a hold of it. So, this is one of the most common things. Most times, if I see a problem in blueberries, it's going to be at least somewhat related to the pH of the plant or of the soil. Swing over to blackberries. Uh, this one comes up every now and then. People will have planted a new blackberry field and they select varieties that are erect. And the first year they'll see something else in the upper left hand corner where the plants are growing on the ground like a trailing blackberry. Uh, before they get through the surge, tell them that uh, the plants will become more erect as they get older. And the same planting is in, uh, shown on the uh, right side. Notice how upright those plants are growing even without a cell. So this is uh, something that comes up every now and then you may get uh, some questions about it. And all the blackberries essentially that we grow, I think need some cellars. And this slide just shows several different cellars and systems. You can be almost as simple as you want with an eye cellar or as elaborate as you want with a rotated cross on cellar. Uh, I like their rotating cross arm. It's got a lot of real advantages. It's expensive to put in, and it takes a fair amount of labor uh, to use it. But perhaps the most realistic uh, cellus, I think, is the two cellus that you see in the lower left hand corner, uh, where you've got uh, canes growing up in the middle, the final canes, that's the next year's crop. But the floor canes that have this year's crop are trained to the wires on the side of the cellus. And by doing this, you separate the fruiting cane from the final cane, get better light, less disease, better fruit quality, and a lot easier harvest. And also a lot easier pruning after harvest when you cut the floor cane job. But some type of support system is definitely recommended. And one of the things that we're doing right now, uh, well, this is getting ahead of myself, this shows uh, the two colors again. Two layers of wires, a lower wire a couple feet off the ground, upper wire uh, three and a half to four feet high. And uh, the width between wires on the bottom, uh, about 24 inches and on top, somewhere around 30, 36 inches. Uh, so again, you can train uh, during the winter the teams that will first floor team to those outside wires and leave the middle open for the final team, which will go straight up towards the sunlight. Uh, this time of year, now this shows the rotating cross arm. And what it is, is uh, 
This was developed for use further north when cold winds beyond Black Bay Harbor. They can grow the canes up on the trellis, like you see in the upper left. Uh, in late fall, they'll actually bend the trellis over to the ground and cover those plants with a mulch, a uh, straw, or something. In the spring of the year, uh, they remove that straw. Uh, when the canes start to grow, the blossoms will all come off on the top of the canes. They're going through to life. After bloom, after the fruit starts to set, they'll take that trellis up off the ground and rotate it about 110 to 115 degrees so that it's actually laying a little bit over to the other side. And all that developing fruit now is on the lower side of that canopy where it's easy to fit. Uh, it's also in, the, in some shade so that you get less sun salt on the fruit. And of course, pick it like working in the shade better. So that's the rotating cross on. But it is a more expensive trellis, uh, as you can see with the hardware, and it also requires more labor. Uh, this time of year, pruning in blackberries is a year round thing. This time of year, we're coming into a time where uh, fruiting is, is just starting. And so uh, with the fourteen bearing blackberry varieties, that is the varieties that bear their fruit on two year old canes. We'll pick those canes and after that those canes are going to die. And they should be removed after harvest. At the same time that you're picking that fruit, the new climate canes are growing from the soil and you want to get them on up straight and top them at about somewhere around uh, well we usually go about 60 inches above ground. Uh, that stiffens the cane and also forces lateral branching and uh, gives you more fruit as a result. And so how we pick those things is fairly important. Uh, we're looking at uh, two scenarios here. Ideally, we'd like to pick a cane when it's about four to six inches taller than what we want it to be. So if you want a cane that's 60 inches, let it get somewhere around 54, 65 inches, but relatively small so you can pinch out that vegetative tip with your fingers as opposed to letting that cane get a lot higher than you want, get somewhat woody and necessitate the use of pruning shears to cut it off. Why do we do that? Well, the big reason, uh, in, well, this will show the lateral branching that we get in axles of the leaves as a result of pinching. You'll get it naturally, but not on as many uh, uh, leaf axes or as early as you would if you pinch those primates. But uh, one of the important things about making small cuts or the pinching as opposed to big ones is we've got a disease called cane blight. And the bigger the wound, the longer it takes it to heal, the greater the chance you get of infection of that pruning cut and cane blight coming as a result. And so if you can pinch the tip out of the cane like you see in the upper left hand side, that small cut will heal or small wound will heal a lot faster than the big cut in the center of the screen and you cut back on your potential for shoot that. I was working in a uh, vineyard actually at the Middle Tennessee Station uh, back in uh, late April, early May and uh, found evidence of bowl activity in the vineyard. Uh, in uh, Tennessee we've got pine bowl all over the state. Their subterranean feeders work underground about two to six inches. In East Tennessee, we've got the meadow bowl. And in the middle, uh, well, pretty much in the Cumberland Plateau out uh, to the west, we have the prairie bowl. Both the meadow bowl and prairie bowl are surface feeders. Um, they like to tunnel in mulches or grasses where they've got some protection from predators. But you can see their tunnels quite often when you work in the field. And this one shows a, a variable tunnel uh, leading underneath the mulch cover that we have in our blueberry. Um, I tell growers, blue, bowl populations are cyclical. That is, they run, run over about a four year period. Uh, you may not see any bowls this year. Don't sit, uh, get complacent and think that you don't have a bowl problem. Because within three to four years, they could be running out of beer. Literally, they, they explode. Um, so, watch when you work the field if you uh, see tunnels. 
if you see voles, but you got a dog that's out digging in the field or on your fruit crop, uh, take that as evidence that you got an active vole population and you might want to take some special steps throughout the year to control voles. This time of year, uh, there's no need of putting out bait, uh, voles won't eat it. Uh, they're, they're going after the succulent, fleshy roots of grasses. After that becomes limited in late fall, then they'll go after more woody to let the roots come on your bushes and trees. And, and so somewhere up in August, if we've got, uh, especially got voles, we might put out boards on the grassy surface in the field, leave them for a couple months, come back and lift that board, and it may expose the cone. Uh, and the, that signifies, of course, that you've got an active bowl population. And it also gives you a good place to put the rodenticide, which should not go down until around November, uh, mid, actually mid to late November. Uh, and uh, we'll put the bait in the tunnels, put the board back down, come back in a couple of weeks and check if the bait is gone. You still have an active population put more bait in the tunnel and put the board back and you come back another couple of weeks. If, however, there's bait still under that board when you lift it, you probably control the bowls in that area. Unless populations are high, bowls do not travel over a very wide range. And so you can assume that that particular area, if it were bait is still up, is that the bowl activity in that area is not occurring anymore. So, but uh, we've got more information on specific rodenticides uh, and methods of application. If people want to get into that, uh, we can certainly help them on that. Um, especially when I talk to, to potential fruit growers in the home garden, I like to show them a list of uh, different crops and, and evaluate them based on how easy it is to control pests. Before spotted wing Gisophila showed up, Blueberries was probably the easiest crop statewide to grow. Uh, we had nobody that I knew of that was on a spray program other than some weeds to grow. Uh, and mustard iron came in right after that. Uh, once spotted wing gasophila showed up, blueberries are no longer the easiest to grow. If you're in an area where spotted wing is a problem, uh, actually we're going to be recommending about well, depending on whether you've got hybrid or rather I have both, upwards of 10 to 12, um, excuse me, upwards of 10 to 12 uh, sprays at weekly intervals to control spotted wing because they can they can explode and populate the um, mud. This is a uh, raspberry, but you can see spotted wing on the berry. Fall bearing raspberries are probably what a, a spot of wind considers to be ice cream. They love it. And, and that's one of the reasons that a lot of states north of us no longer recommend fall bearing raspberries. Uh, until we get a better control for spot of wind, it's just not a viable crop. But they'll hit several small fruits. Uh, they'll get into strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. They get into cherries, some reports in cherry tomatoes. Uh, they've been reported in peaches. I've never seen it there, but this uh, is a uh, blueberry. And you can see uh, the holes where the larvae emerge. And in the uh, one uh, berry, you can see where the larvae is emerging. Uh, and then you can see the press spots and other berries that indicate where larvae seed occur. So we have this a lot. I know I visited a, a grower in Murray County uh, and uh, she'd had a lot of problems over the last two years. And some places have and some places don't, but be aware uh, that they can be an issue. But overwinter is as adults in our area, when the weather gets hot, they increase in, in population very, very quickly. Got this just the other day out of Obion County uh, on Peach. Uh, this is uh, an auction herbicide uh, damage. Uh, in this particular case, and I'm kind of speaking out of school, but it's 2,4-D damage. Originally, we suspected dicamba. Unfortunately, it did not tend to do that. 
But uh, herbicide damage is something we're seeing every year. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's something that uh, you may be confronted with. Uh, in this particular case, the grower used 2,4-D under the trees to control white clover, and 2,4-D is not that good. Uh, Stinger, which is labeled for use in the seed source, is going to be a whole lot better option. But we saw it, you may see these same types of things. I got this uh, a sample came in out of Van Buren County uh, the other day, where these shoots were getting these uh, dead uh, old punch, uh, a uh, whole bunch of decaying in the cane dying and breaking off. This is called a great cane gurgler. It's an insect, and it'll come in and write and make two rings around a, a vegetative cane, uh, puncturing that cane. It will lay its eggs in the section between those. And sooner or later, that cane is going to break off and fall to the ground. And the when the eggs hatch, a lot of you are going to go back into the soil. In the cycle complete are uh, complete, but usually this is more of a cosmetic problem than it is an economic problem. Quite often, uh, it occurs on non fruitful shoots. But for the homeowner, if they have this, if they can pick up those shoots or cut off a shoot on the vine before it has a chance to break over and get that pruning away from the plant, they can interrupt the cycle and, and do a lot to control the seed. Got a call the other day about mare's tail in a, a strawberry field. The grower was actually wanting to double crop the field with pumpkins and, and uh, strawberries afterwards. It's not possible when you've got this kind of a problem. Uh, obviously, it, they've been using glyphosate, and, and so they've got resistance. Uh, what did we recommend? Basically, go in and remove the plastic. Fill the field, work it, come back and uh, form the beds, and then uh, Chateau has got a label for mare's tail in strawberry. Recommendation is to come in after the beds have been formed, but before the plastic has been laid, and at least 30 days before planting, and spray uh, the beds with Chateau. Um, and then go ahead and, and lay the irrigation line and lay the plastic. Now, you can spray the entire surface of the ground. One of the problems though is Chateau uh, can be damaging to ryegrass. And a lot of growers use that as a living mulch in your special bed. So if that's the case, uh, you can spray just the beds. Uh, come back in the spring after you've killed off the, the uh, ryegrass and spray the middle. At the same rate, just make sure that you keep it off the plant, keep it off the tree, and uh, it should be decent control. Also, of course, every year we get questions about cedar apple rust, uh, and, and this is cedar rust. You can see the galls in the upper left uh, on the cedar trees, red cedar. Uh, in the spring of the year, when you get a warm rainy spell, the spore horns, the uh, yellowish orange spore horns, will come out. Spores are moving to the apple, and you'll see the foliar symptoms, which are more uh, uh, often seen on the apple, and you can also see some of the damage on the on fruit. And then in the late summer, fall, the spores come back to the cedar. Without using the cedar or the apple, the disease doesn't exist. But uh, since the spores can move several miles if they have to, uh, you can't really rogue out the cedar trees and uh, get by, but you can spray using the development of the disease as an indicator of when you spray the apple. Or it allows your eyes to have resistance to the uh, apple. And uh, if you're going to plant, especially for the homeowner, they'd be better off selecting those varieties. This morning I got in this picture, uh, and this is a pear. Uh, and uh, if you look at the fruit, um, this is Cedar quince rust. It's very closely related to cedar apple rust, but it shows up different. And you can see these pears that are completely consumed by the cedar quince rust. And contrary to cedar apple rust, which shows up more on the leaves, cedar quince rust shows up more on the fruit. 
and uh, just stir the course and that's it, no good. Uh, likely see the rust. Uh, once you see symptoms of either seeing the rust or seeing the quince rust, it's too late to do anything. Infection has occurred, you can stop. Uh, but when you see the quince rust, it does sometimes kill the shoots that that fruit is on, turning those shoots off, getting them away from the tree before the spores are released and you fall one of that to the cedar can help control it. But I got this in this morning. You can see the spotting on the leaves, but usually uh, it's not at that pronounced in what you will see is the fruit infection. And then an apple, we've got several diseases, some of rot that we concern ourselves with. Uh, in many cases, if you go out and look at an apple tree now, you'll see what we call frog eye leaf spot, and that's in the upper left corner. Uh, and then uh, below that on the fruit is black rot. And black rot is the same organism, but the correlation between leaf spot and fruit rot is not real good. But you can see the mummified apples hanging uh, on that lower slide in contact with the fruit, that's a primary source of inoculum. So in pruning, those need to be gotten off the tree. And then we do spray uh, beginning at silver tip early on to this disease. A more common apple summer rot is the rot. It's probably the biggest disease we have. Uh, the trees are the fruits that are susceptible all the way from fruit set right up until and even after harvest. And the problem is, uh, with bitter rot is that you've got about a five hour infection period. If you get a rain and the fruit stays wet during the mid to latter part of the growing season for about five hours or more, you've got an active infection period. So it's a difficult one to control. There's another disease called white rot that looks on the surface of the apple very similar, but uh, it's important to be able to de uh, determine whether you've got bitter rot or white rot. And the way we do that is cut the fruit open after the rot is developed. On the left is white rot, and you can see the uh, lesion going from the outside to the fruit all the way to the cavity or the seed cavity, almost in a cylindrical fashion. Whereas on bitter rot, the lesion is more triangular or funnel shaped. And I use that as a primary way to distinguish between the two. Uh, the problem we have with bitter rot is that we have infection period all summer long. And, and it's hard to control. Uh, good pruning and starting early is going to be the only way to do it. If you've got plums, you've got black. Uh, this is a fungal disease that is showing up. I've seen it several times so far this year. Uh, when, when you see it, pruning it out, it's possible, well, it's the number one way to start to control. We come back in several inches below where you see that uh, knot and make the cuts and then get that away from the tree. Uh, there are some fungicides that are labeled for control, but without the pruning aspect, spraying is a waste of time. Uh, we'll see black knot on almost every plum variety. We also see it on chips. Works on tarts and leaves on sweet, so we get them both. This spring we had more leaf curl. This is an old disease that, that uh, when I first started in Tennessee, I saw a lot of it. Went many years without ever seeing any, and now it seems to make it a comeback. The first leaves that come out in the spring of the year are going to be distorted, they're thickened, they're wrinkled, they'll be discolored. They may be red, purple, yellow, eventually turn black and fall off. Sometimes the fruit will actually be affected. The later leaves that come out will be normal, but the problem is if you have a heavy leaf curl infection uh, and you lose all those first leaves, the tree is very weak now. It's expended all its stored energy on that first part of growth, and so it's going to be slow to come out with normal leaves. If that's the case, you need to thin the top pretty heavy and give the tree a chance to recover. Control uh, is a fungicide spray while the tree is gone. After the tree is broken down, after the buds have started to swell, control is no longer an option. And brown rot, of course, is in all the stone fruits, is going to be the most common disease. And, and as we approach rapidly, uh, brown rot is going to be 
are much more evident than it ever is. And for the homeowner, sanitation, uh, getting the fruit off in the early stages of the rot will slow it spread. Uh, you can spray the tap in up to then uh, the legal limit, uh, but the sanitation, picking up the uh, off the rotted fruit, picking off the mummified fruit after harvest, raking it up off the ground, those are going to be the better controls for the homeowner. Fertility is an issue that I like a lot and I'd like to argue with people about. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but what I'm seeing on all crops is that a lot of people are wasting money on fertilizer uh, or doing or causing some problems with fertilizer. And so, uh, for you, the best thing to do is for fertilization is to get the pH where it needs to be before you plant and try to keep it there. Uh, that way you can maximize the availability of the nutrients. We look at the time of fertilizer application before we plant. Uh, there's no need for nitrogen, of course, because it's so mobile in the soil, but that's the time to adjust our, our phosphorus and our potassium along with soil fertility. Uh, after the plants in the ground, especially once they get fruity, nitrogen is the only element and all the fruit crops we probably need at application of the year. Use in large amounts and about a third of the nitrogen uh, that a plant uses to grow a crop leaves the tree or the vine in the crop. The rest is in the wood and in the leaves. Uh, so we, we use nitrogen every year. Ideally, we'll put the other nutrients down only when we have good reason to uh, suspect there's a problem, like using tissue culture in the commercial forest. Um, we're looking at uh, fruit crops are different. You do know this, but, uh, but most fruit trees, bushes, shrubs, you got to plant and live in fruit for many years. Uh, and what you do this year affects what happens next year. As we've already mentioned, you'll have several years between the time you plant and you get the first crop and several more years that will go between that first crop and the full crop. And the fruit buds are formed during the summer of the previous year. So on apples, fruit bud formation for 2021 started back in May. The peach will start getting up in August, blueberries in August. Grapes started about blue in June, late May to June. We started to see bud initiation for 2021. So you've got a long-term uh, commitment in growing these crops. Another thing that sets fruit crops apart is because they are multi-year crops, uh, early growth of the plant and the crop experiment is directly related to the health of the plant as it went going. For the first 30 days or so on all these fruit crops, all the energy that they use for that first flush of growth comes from stored reserves in the plant. So if you lose the leaves early in the fall, you have low level of reserves, the plant's going to be weak in the spring. Uh, actually, the roots are not capable of picking up moisture and nutrients at the time of bud break, and it takes several weeks before they are. So it's important to get a healthy plant going into the growing season. Um, that's about it. I'm going to quit there, I think, because I've about run the course. I did, I'm always amazed or challenged, I guess, by, by some of the things we're confronted with. And I, at least I hope y'all get some every now and then make, uh, questions that make you scratch your head and stop to think. But uh, I get stuff like this. Uh, grower said, I put three pounds of triple 17 in every 500 gallon spray tank for every silver spray in the apple. What do you think about that? Well, first off, you don't want to hurt the growers' feelings by telling them he's wasting his money. But, you know, these are things that we come up, have to uh, deal with and try to figure out answers. And, and uh, I guess it's one of the things that makes it fun. But uh, it's, uh, I think the longer I work here, the more I realize I don't know a whole lot about it. Anymore. So, uh, if there are any questions, I'll, I'll try to. Answer them, uh, or maybe confuse confuse further. 
Hey, Doc. We got a couple questions in the chat box here. Okay. Um, first question is, is from Lisa. It says, blueberry primocane tip pruning. Is it helpful to paint the wound with wax or some kind of sealant? If you can make the uh, cut, well, actually, pinch them as opposed to cutting them, I would not treat it with anything. I, I, uh, they'll heal fairly quickly, or they'll seal themselves off fairly quickly, so that uh, infection is not going to be a problem. If you make a big cut, then ideally we would, we would like to spray it with a fungicide so that we can protect that cut surface. All right, and then the second question um, is, should high bush and low bush blueberries be, be uh, tallied differently? I don't know if that's the word she's looking for or not. Should high bush and low bush blueberries be tallied differently? Okay, what, if I was going to- Trail it differently. Tell it, okay, no, no. Uh, you know, uh, now with uh, the same blueberries as opposed to blackberries now? I'm guessing that they're the, the couple of different, right, different types of blueberries is what she's Normally, asking. Yeah, we're growing the rabbit eye and the high bush. Now within the high bush, we're growing some southern high bush and some northern high bush. But for all three of those, rabbit eye, southern high bush, and northern high bush, we use about the same plant form and the same idea in, in designing the plant. And, and uh, so I, I look at a, a mature blueberry plant somewhere in the neighborhood of five feet in height and a, a spread of about four feet in canopy is the ideal scenario. Uh, and we can accomplish that actually without a solar system in that. Now, if we're growing blackberries, it, they, they sell some uh, varieties they call erect growing, and some that are semi-erect, and they're actually like some trailing blackberries. I feel that all blackberries, regardless of whether they're erect or semi-erect, need a trellis to hold them up. And the trellis would be the same for both sides. If there is anybody else that would like to ask um, Dr. Lockwood a question, you can either unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat box, whatever you feel comfortable with. Is there any more questions? I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Um, so my parents have a small vineyard in Gibson County, and I know you spoke briefly about Gibson County and Weekly County. Um, they're uh, great got hit by that freeze or that frost that we had um they're growing out of it pretty well relatively well for as bad as they got hit but the one major difference that i can see in them is that instead of the vines wanting to run and trellis the vines are wanting to grow straight up I don't know if that was a, because of the freeze, but that's just something that I'm kind of seeing uh, with their vines. Yeah, I, I suspect it is going to be at least somewhat related to the freeze. Uh, if they lost most of the crop, if there's not much of a crop, that means that all the energy on that plant is now going into vegetative growth. And and uh, tendency of, of really vigorous growth is going to be more upright. It's going to the sun. Uh, that's going to be a little bit of a, a challenge when you prune this winter, but maybe also it's an opportunity. Uh, it might be an opportunity if the vines have got several eight years of age on them to cut off, say, a cordon that's pruned on the wire back to the trunk and take a new cane that grew off the trunk in that general vicinity and lay it down on the wire and, and essentially remove the plant from the plant. So there's it's too bad the frost happened and too bad the crop got decimated in many cases, but trying to make the best out of a bad situation, it does give us a little more flexibility in, uh, in, in rejuvenating those vines if they are in need.
All right, Doc, we got a couple more questions in the chat box. Uh, first question is, when is the best time to prune brambles? Okay, the best time, actually there's going to be several times throughout the year. Uh, when, when you finish harvest, well, during harvest, it depends. The prime canes, the new canes that grow this year, when they get up to a little bit above the height that you want, generally when they get up about four to five inches or so, taller than what you want them to be, prune the top of it, pinch them out ideally uh, to stop the upright growth and to force them to lateral branch. The more lateral branches you have, the more fruit you're going to have. So we'll do that. Actually, I did that on, on a couple of blackberries in my backyard over the weekend. Uh, and then when the uh, floricanes have fruit on them this year, when they finish harvest, if you could cut those canes out at that time, it would help give more life for the developing time canes. It also helps to interrupt any disease cycle. Any disease you might have on the old cane could be interrupted before it has a chance to infect the new cane. So that would be another time to prune. A third time to prune is going to be in late winter when those lateral branches that develop on the prime cane uh, need to be cut back on a healthy plant somewhere around 18 inches or so in length. By doing that, you get better light, better air, better spray penetration, better fruit quality, uh, and the plant is a lot more manageable. So there are several times throughout the growing season when you're going to be doing some All right. <clears throat> the next question is with strawberries. After the first year, do they need to be thinned or just trimmed back? Ideally, they need to be thinned. And, and it depends a lot. If you've got a vigorous planting uh, in the uh, home garden, what we do a lot of times is, is uh, take the lawnmower out there, raise it up enough so that you don't damage the crown, and, and after harvest, just mow off the top of the planting. Uh, the plants are going to be semi dormant at that time, and by getting mowing off that, if you've got a leaf spot disease, uh, you can help to uh, control it. And then after we've done that, uh, I'd like to go in and fertilize with a, a balanced fertilizer. Uh, and so after we've done that, we'll start to remove some of the old plants and thin out some of those old plants. The idea being that the remaining plants are going to start to put out runners. And you get better production off of a runner than you will that motor plant being saved over for a second year. And so we get rid of the, a lot of the old plants and give room for new runner plants to take down. And by fertilizing before we pull out those plants, we help them cultivate the fertilizer. And then we'll come back in in August with a side dress of, of nitrogen because that's when fruit has to be important. So I, you need to be fairly aggressive on removing a bunch of that old plant uh, to force new runner production. Because that's where your best yields will be. All right, is there any other questions for Dr. Lockwood? Dr. Lockwood, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, we had uh, a lot of da hail damage uh, 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 early spring. We got some, we've got uh, 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 several one to three year old. Uh, trees. Uh, is there anything I need to do to uh, I mean, to cover up the, the the marks, the pot marks, and the, the open wounds that are there? Best thing you can do for it is, is uh, just um, spray if you can. What it, if it's a uh, if it's a peach tree, for example, uh, lesser bore are going to be attracted to some of those wounds before they heal. Uh, and so an insecticide spray may help them. On apple trees, if you get damaged, quite often you'll see an infestation of woolly apple coming in uh, and, uh, around that wound. If it's a young tree, uh, I'm talking about you know one, two year old, or so, and you got pretty heavy hail damage, I'm going to start to look at rebuilding the scaffold. This coming winter, if I've got some 
new shoots available, I'm going to cut some of the old ones off and try to train new ones to take their place because the new ones won't have the damage that could cause problems for several years down the road. But uh, right now, I wouldn't, I would not put a wound dressing on any of those wounds. No, it actually could inhibit the healing. Thank you. What? All right, there's, uh, we got one more question here in the chat box. Um, for fruit trees, will having two to four different varieties grafted on one tree offer enough cross pollination for a good crop compared to having multiple trees? Um, theoretically, yes, in reality, no. Uh, what happens when you have multiple crops on one or varieties on one tree is quite often one or more will be a lot more vigorous than some of the others and over time they're going to crowd out some of those other varieties and so your options of, uh, for good cross-pollination are not as good. If you've got room you're better off with individual varieties on individual trees relatively close. You'll get better cross pollination, better longevity. If you're crowded and if you know where the, the varieties are, where you can do the pruning, you may be able to, to maintain that tree uh, for a lot longer period of time because you would be able to, to do the, you know, prune back the more vigorous varieties and keep it from pushing out the weaker ones. So normally I don't like a five and one. I, uh, I did a printing demonstration years ago and got all done. I did a beautiful job on the tree. It got all done. The guy told me, this is a five-in-one apple tree. And I told him it to be a five-in-one. Uh, probably had cut out at least one, if not two varieties in the pruning process. Uh, they're not my favorite pieces. All right. <clears throat> We're going to do this last question here, Doc Lockwood. Um, question is, do you offer grafting classes or no bean grafting classes around or publications on grafting? The answer to that is yes. Uh, I do grafting classes. Actually, I've been doing one in Saving County for 23 years now. Uh, in the first Saturday in March, uh, on a private uh, operation. Uh, but we also have done grafting classes in, in uh, numerous counties around the state. I would look forward to working with you on that if you wanted to do that. I do have some information, both printed and uh, uh, PowerPoint, on drafting that I can afford you. Uh, you can use it uh, however you want. Uh, but yeah, I, I like to draft and, and uh, I enjoy teaching it. Uh, so get in touch with me. Uh, I'd like to talk to you further about it if you want. Right. Thank you again, Doc, for being with us today. Uh, we sure appreciate it. Uh, for those of you that are still with us, uh, we'll have another lunch series on Thursday at 12 noon, and uh, we're going to be talking about green and water minerals uh, in your landscape. So if you're interested, in that, be sure to join us next Thursday at 12. Appreciate everybody being with us today.